testable. In the King James Version, it's translated abominable or abomination. The Hebrew word for detestable or abominable is a word that means that something is so abhorrent that it causes nausea. God the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to record for us here a particular word that God uses to show his detestable, abhorrent reaction to certain practices. This word, abomination, detestable, is also used of homosexual behavior. It's also used of idolatry. And so whatever these practices are, they are said to be detestable to the Lord. Now, what do we find here? Notice some of the practices was human sacrifice. There shall be none found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. This was a practice that was known in ancient Israel, in ancient Canaan, when people would sacrifice their children to various gods. Do these sacrifices still take place today? Yes. They do take place in certain satanic circles where human sacrifice still continues. But this form of human sacrifice still goes on today in this very country. The only difference is we don't call it burning children alive. We call it abortion, particularly killing children by in injecting saline solution into the womb of the mother, thereby burning the child. God says this is detestable. Notice he also mentions divination or sorcery. What is divination? Predicting the future. Trying to divine things, define the future through various means. He forbids sorcery. Those who interpret omens or signs or auspicious signs. Those who engage in witchcraft. And this is a practice that is also very much alive today. Today they don't call it witchcraft. It's known today by a more popular term, Wicca. W-I-C-C-A. Those who practice witchcraft. What is witchcraft? The worship of the forces of nature, the worship of the elements, earth, water, fire, and so forth. He also mentions those who cast spells or those who are mediums. What are mediums? Mediums are channelers, people who channel. That is, people who are mediating between you and the spirits of the departed. Those who engage in what we call seances or those who consult the dead, or as the King James puts it, necromancy. Notice verse 12. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. They are abominable to the Lord. And so Scripture is very clear that the reason why God is going to drive these nations out is because they practice these things. And as you go through the Old Testament, what do you find when you look through the history of the Old Testament? The very things that God has warned about here, you will notice in the Old Testament, whenever the people went into apostasy, when their kings went into apostasy, what did they do? They consulted mediums, they started stargazing, they went to the astrologers to divine future events, etc., etc. Now going into the New Testament, if we go to Ephesians chapter 6, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul ends this very important letter before issuing his final greetings to the church of Ephesus. I want you to notice very carefully, Paul ends with an exhortation for Christians to be prepared to armor themselves, to arm themselves against spiritual darkness. Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that, you may, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice verse 12, please. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, 
Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now notice what Paul is saying here. What is he doing? He's using the analogy of a Roman soldier. Notice he mentions the helmet. He mentions the breastplate. He mentions the shield. He mentions the belt. He mentions the shoes. He mentions the sword. He's using the analogy of a soldier. And what is he saying here? He is telling us that the Christian walk is a walk of spiritual warfare. We are in a constant state of spiritual warfare. Against whom? Flesh and blood? By no means. We're not in a struggle against men and women. We are in a struggle against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world. And therefore, as Christian believers, we must realize that we are in a spiritual battle. And that battle will continue until Christ returns. Now notice that the Roman soldier, the armor for the soldier only covered one part of the body. It only covered the front. The Roman soldier had no protection on his back. Why were they designed to wear their armor that way? There's one thing the Roman armies never were told to do under pain of death. They never retreat. Because the moment you turn around, you'll be killed. That's why, folks, I cannot stand the term. You hear of every summer people say, we're going on a church retreat. Well, since when does the church retreat? I have to ask that question. Jesus said that the gates of Hades will not prevail against my church. The church will advance. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. Where did we get the idea that the church of God retreats? We don't retreat, we advance. And we conquer, we break down the gates of Hades. So notice that Paul then is telling us we are in a state of war. But this state of war is with the demonic, the evil powers. The Apostle Paul refers to the leader of this evil empire, if you will, he refers to him in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4 as the God of this age that has blinded the minds. Please notice where he blinds. He doesn't blind the heart. He doesn't blind the physical eyes. He blinds the minds of those who don't believe. Why the minds? Because the mind is the seat of the mental faculty. It's where we process thought, where we process logic. He attacks that part of the human and he veils their eyes. Of, he veils their minds so that they will not believe. The Lord Jesus Christ referred to the leader of this evil empire. He referred to him as the prince of this world. The ruler of this world. And in Ephesians 2.2, 2, Paul says, he is the prince of the power of the air. He's not contrary to modern stereotypes. He's not in hell roasting people on a spit with his hordes of demons. Where is Satan today, ladies and gentlemen? He goes up and to, to and fro throughout the whole earth. He is here in this world. He will one day be cast down. He will one day be chained. But for now, he rules as the prince of the power of the air, and he has followers, and he has ministers, According to 2 Corinthians 11.15, his ministers transform themselves as apostles of Christ, for it is no strange thing that Satan himself could also disguise himself, transform himself as an angel of light. And so this brings us to the New Age movement. The New Age movement, a very odd title, because the irony about the New Age movement is that it is nothing new at all. And folks, there's a model I'd like you to learn tonight. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. But you see, the West is so enamored with new and improved. We have a new and improved product for you. And we think, wow, this is great. We should buy this. This is, this is great. This is new. But the irony behind all this is that the New Age movement is actually the old age movement. It's actually one of the oldest movements in the world. It's been around 
for millennia. In fact, it predates Jesus Christ. It was being practiced in Babylon. It was practiced in Egypt. It was practiced by the Canaanites. It was practiced by the Assyrians. The elements that we call the New Age movement are actually, ironically, the Old Age movement. It just was known by different names like Spiritism, Astrology. And in fact, the mother of the New Age movement is Hinduism. Eastern mysticism, which has birthed every element we find in the New Age. The only difference is the New Age movement has labeled it with Western terminology. It's an old poison put in a new bottle with a new label put on it. But it's still the same old poison. Now what exactly is the New Age movement? It's not a very easy organization, movement to define because the New Age movement does not have boundaries. It's not like the cults that have boundaries. They have heretical belief systems. The New Age movement is best described, in my opinion, as a mosaic, a picture made up of many, many pieces. There are many elements of the New Age movement. It's not just one thing. It's a multifaceted movement. It's not an organized group with a, with a guru leader. It doesn't have a central headquarters. It can't be bordered. It is a movement without boundaries. But it's a movement that has infiltrated religion, sports, music, sales, science, psychology, art, business, education, the cartoons that your children watch. Some of them are infiltrated with New Age ideologies, movies, politics, medicine, and even the United Nations, of all places. The New Age movement can be found in various religions. You have some of them here in the Victoria area. I saw them in the past few days. Groups like religious science, new thought, Christian science. These groups are known as mind science cults that emphasize the reality of the spirit, that the material world is an illusion, it's not real, and that man ideally is made in the image of God. And since God is spirit, man ideally is spirit. You could see it in sports. Anthony Robbins. How many of you know Anthony Robbins? You've heard of Anthony Robbins. What is Anthony Robbins all about? Human potentiality. You could realize your dreams. You have the potential within yourselves to realize your dreams. You could visualize your dreams. That's New Age philosophy. That's New Age thinking. What about music? How many of you have heard of New Age music? You've been in HMV, have been in some of the stores? You will find a section called New Age Music, which is geared towards spirituality. You will find it, for instance, in the area of sales. Go into chapters or Indigo in Victoria or Vancouver, and you will notice that the New Age section is double or triple the size of the Christianity section. Why is there an interest in the New Age movement? Why is there an allure in the New Age movement? Look at politics. Not too long ago in Canada, we actually had a party that was trying to run on the federal level called the Natural Law Party. How many of you remember them? The Natural Law Party. What was their dream? They said, we will curb crime in Canada. We will fix the economy. We're going to bring peace to Canada and the world. And how are they going to do that? By having MPs in Ottawa, and these MPs would be yogic flyers, yogis that could fly and levitate. This actually happened, friends, in this country. What about movies? How many of you like Star Wars? Star Wars fans in the house? Well, in Star Wars, George Lucas is a member of the New Age. He buys into the New Age philosophy. Remember in Star Wars, was the greeting or the saying, the Lord be with you? No, the force be with you. What's the force? Well, you see, there's the good side of the force, and there's the bad side of the force. Remember little Yoda? Hmm, teach I will? Hmm, yes, the force, you must use the force. Now, 
what's the good side of the force and what's the bad side of the force. Well, folks, this is Taoism. This is the yin and the yang. The black and the white, the male and the female principle. This is New Age philosophy. What is the force? The force is the reality of the universe, that which makes up the universe. That is what we call pantheism. All is God, God is all. Now, where did the New Age movement evolve from? Well, the New Age movement is not a movement that believes in God, certainly not the God of the Bible. The New Age movement is actually a religious form of secular humanism. It's secular humanism with a religious twist. If you want to compare it to anything, the, mo the closest you can compare it to is Buddhism. What did the Buddhists teach? Well, for one thing, Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha, taught that there was no God. There is no deity who created the universe. Matter is eternal, time is eternal, and the divine is within everything. You are divine, and that's why you must go into the deep recesses of the mind. You must meditate. What is the whole point of meditation? To discover your divinity within you. And so the emphasis is not on prayer, because that means praying to someone other than yourself, object, subject, relationship. Meditation is turning in to yourself, going deep into your subconscious to discover what? To discover that you are God to discover that you are divine. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Out on a Limb with Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine, and there was a, a, a piece in the movie where she's in front of Malibu Beach, and she is saying, I am God, I am God. And I wish I was on the set, because I'd say, okay, Shirley, start walking on the water. Let's see you walk on the water. That's New Age, and Shirley MacLaine, John Denver, who's now deceased, and many others buy into this ideology that we're talking about. Well, where did this come from, this idea of the New Age movement? Well, in order to understand this, we have to go back to the 50s and the 40s. We've got to go back over 60 years ago. And what was dominating Western civilization, particularly North America, was a worldview. A worldview is basically what the world is like through your eyes. It's what you believe. It's a set of beliefs about reality. And in the 40s and 50s, there was a belief called materialism or secular humanism. This philosophy says everything is matter. Everything is material. What you could see, touch, hear, taste, the five senses determine reality empiricism is the way to go. Materialism. There is no such thing as spirit. There is no such thing as God. There is no such thing as angels. There is no such thing as miracles. We live in a closed system. Everything is matter. So if it's all matter, never mind. And the pendulum, you see, the pendulum moved all the way to the left and the materialists were saying, man is a dog. He's an animal. He is an evolved species. Darwin is right. Man is the naked ape. And they believe this. This is nothing new. The, the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, many of the Greek philosophers taught the idea that man is the measure of all things. Man is the zenith of all things. Man determines what is right for himself. Well, you see, folks, what happened was people realized that they couldn't live with this lifestyle. They began to realize that all we are, if all we are is just matter and there's nothing beyond this life, nothing beyond the grave, then this created a sense of despair. If this is all there is, then what's the point of living? If there's no hope, if there's no God, if there's no resurrection, if there's no salvation, then, then we're just animals and we might as well live as we please. And people began to become very complacent with this worldview. And then something happened in the 50s. A psychologist by the name of J.B. Rhine, R-H-I-N-E, came along and started playing with the concept, and he invented the term ESP, extrasensory perception. And Dr. Rhine proposed that humans were not just matter, 
but he said there is a spiritual dimension to man and therefore man is not just material, man in fact is really spiritual. And where did Dr. Ryan get this idea from? He was dabbling in Eastern mysticism. He went into Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and he began to teach. Now notice the pendulum folks, man is a dog. Now here comes the pendulum, it's coming all the way to the other side and what is the word dog spelled backwards? Man is a god. Now the New Age was teaching man is divine. Man is God. And all of a sudden in the 1960s all of these humanists became what? They became New Agers. And then you have the gurus of India coming to North America in the 60s. You have Rajneesh, Father Divine. You had people like Yogi Maharesh Mahesh Yogi, Transcendental Meditation. That's a long name. Imagine being called by that name. Imagine that on your passport. And when they came to the West, what did they bring? They brought something which they claimed was new, when in fact it was just plain Hinduism with a new label on it. And all of a sudden, who started joining in? Remember the Beatles? The Beatles started joining in. They were enamored by this. And George Harrison, who is now deceased, one of the Beatles, George Harrison died a faithful member of the Hare Krishna cult, a follower of Hare Krishna, who according to Hare Krishna is the blue-skinned master of demons. We all know who the master of demons is. And so there was a rise in New Age. And then all of a sudden, what do you start hearing on the radio? This is the age of Aquarius. The age, right? Well, what's the age of Aquarius? Well, you have to understand that these constellations, what do these things mean? Well, what they were saying was that Christianity was the age of Pisces. What is Pisces? The fish. Ever wonder why Christians have fishes in the back of their cars? You know? We, my wife and I got one, just a simple fish symbol. And my father-in-law thought it was the Captain Highliner symbol. <laughs> and then we eventually filled it in with the name, the, the Greek word for, for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Well, the age of Pisces was believed to be the age of Christianity, and the age of Pisces is passing away. It's now discarded. It's, it's now obsolete. And what has replaced the age of Pisces? The age of Aquarius. And what is the age of Aquarius? The age of Aquarius is the age of self-realization, the age of recognizing that man is, in fact, God himself. Now, why is the New Age movement very attractive? Why is it that the Beatles wouldn't go to Jesus Christ? In fact, they claimed they were more famous than Jesus Christ. I got them a lot of hot water. But why is it that the Beatles never went to Jesus Christ? Why did they go to the East? Why did they go and join these groups? Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is the New Age movement is very attractive. It's very appealing. Why is it attractive and appealing? It, prom it promises a better life. It tells you that you can have wealth beyond your imagination. Does that sound familiar, those of you who watch televangelists? It says that you can have not only wealth beyond your imagination, you will have health. You will never be sick. You should never have a flu. You should never cough. You should always be healthy. It promises you power. It promises you access into the world beyond. And it promises that you can have knowledge of the universe, knowledge of yourself, and also knowledge of your past lives. That's right. You could have knowledge of your past lives. What does that mean? The New Age movement also teaches reincarnation which is a central point of Hinduism. The only problem is this. Reincarnation is not an Eastern term. Reincarnation is a Western label. The classical name of this doctrine is the Sanskrit word samsara. S-A-M-S-A-R-A. It means cyclical birth, cyclic rebirth. Now, the classical doctrine of samsara doesn't say, a lot of people today who believe in reincarnation, like Shirley MacLaine and others, believe that they were great, noble people in past lives. They will tell you they served in the court of Pharaoh. I served with Alexander the Great. 
and I was this courtier in this court, and I was, I was a, a woman who was murdered in this palace. And you always hear these stories that they were humans in their past lives. That is not the doctrine of samsara. The doctrine of samsara teaches that you go from the lowest point, the lowest species, and you go through cyclic rebirth, and you go up the scale, and you can become, you can start off as a maggot, you can become a fly, a cook, uh, then you can become a cockroach, you can become a frog, you can become a cat, a dog, a pig, a cow. If you killed someone in a past life, you'll come back as a cow or a pig and then be slaughtered. The whole idea is of an evolutionary movement going upwards. And if you have bad karma, back down you go and you've got to work your way up again. Now you see the West, who wants to think that they're going to go back and be a cucaracha? Who wants to go back to being a cockroach? Well, no, the West doesn't like that. So Westerners talk about past lives as humans. That is not the classical doctrine of samsara. That is a Western relabeling, a Western reinvention. What is the claims of the New Age movement? Very attractive. They teach all religions are one. All religions are one. All religions are true. And when I have lectures at various universities, you'd be, you'd be surprised how many students don't understand the fallacy of these statements. I've had people say to me, Tony, all religions are true. Really? Yes. So when Muslims say Jesus isn't the Son of God, and Christians say Jesus is the Son of God, can those two statements be true one and at the same time? Well, no, because that's a contradiction. I'll never forget, a Muslim once came up to me after a debate I had at the University of Toronto, and uh, he came up to me and he said, Brother Tony, why are we arguing? Your God and my God is the same God. I put my arm around him and I said, praise the Lord, brother. I said, you believe God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He said, oh, uh, no, 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 no. Allah is not the Trinity. Allah is one. And I said, you mean the Quran is wrong? You mean when the Quran says your God and my God are one and the same, you mean Allah doesn't know what I believe? Well, that raises serious problems. And then, and then you have people in university settings, students will say to me, there are no absolutes in life. And I would ask them, are you absolutely sure about that? And they would say, absolutely. Another one says to me, you can't know anything for certain. Are you certain about that? Yes. It's like the person who says, I don't understand a word of English, while they use English to tell you that. This is known as a self-refuting argument. And so they teach all religions are one, all are ways to enlightenment. They believe in the brotherhood of all mankind, and they believe that the New Age movement will become the manifestation of the kingdom of God on the earth. Now tell me, isn't this a very attractive statement? All religions are true. All religions are one. All men are brothers. We believe in the brotherhood of all mankind. Now, which of us would object to that? Is that not an attractive statement? Well, of course it is. The only problem is, it's not true. It's demonstrably false. Now, what are some of the claims that the New Age movement has made? Well, they have made, some of them have claimed that Christ has returned. Others believe that we are all gods and that we are all Christs. Some of them have made the following practices very popular today. Astrology. There are some people that will not begin the day without checking their horoscopes. And they are horror scopes, to be sure. They will check to see if the stars are in alignment. What do the stars say for me today? There are people who will tell you about the belief in reincarnation. And they will even say that the Bible teaches reincarnation, which it does not. They will tell you that we could find things out by looking at crystal balls or tarot cards. There are people who get involved in seances. What are seances? Seances are gatherings where you meet with a channeler or a medium and 
you ask that person to connect you with your departed father, your departed mother, your departed brother or sister, and you can communicate with them. The Ouija board, which is sold by Mattel in Walmart and other stores, which they call a child's game. The Ouija board is a divination device. It's very old. In fact, the Supreme Court of, of the United States ruled that the Ouija board was a religious item. It's a religious instrument. It's not a game. It's very old. The idea of psychics, going to a psychic to find the body of an abducted person. Psychics are famous in the New Age movement. Astral travel. You can have out-of-body experiences. UFOs. Did you know that there is a cult following of interest in unidentified flying objects? And then you have good luck charms. And you have crystals and various rocks. Now what are the main beliefs of the New Age movement? The cardinal central belief of the New Age movement is that it denies the existence of an infinite personal God who exists outside and independent of the universe. What does that mean? It does not believe that God is distinct from creation. It does not believe that God is a personal God, that is a personal entity with a mind, with a will, with emotion, an entity that can communicate with us, an entity that, can com that we can communicate with, that we can be in relationship with. What then does the New Age do with God? The New Age says God is everything. And this is pantheism or monism, M-O-N-I-S-M. -S monism means all is one. If all is God, then all is one. Well, this runs into a couple of problems. I've dealt with some New Agers, and they say, all is God. And I said, well, if God is all, and all is God, then everything should be good. Is God good? Yes. Well, then if all is God, then all is good. Well, if all is God, and all is good, what do we do with murder? What do we do with theft? What do we do with rape? The response that some New Agers give is that these things are merely an illusion of the mind. And I've met some of them. Christian science. If you ever go into a Christian science reading room, and there's nothing Christian about it, by the way. Christian science is like grape nuts. It's neither grape nor nuts. It's neither Christian nor is it science. I've been in Christian science reading rooms where people have told me, I'm not kidding you, they said, you can't even prove that we're here. And I, I started hearing that. Remember that theme song of the Twilight Zone? You start hearing that. And, 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 and I'm dealing with people who don't believe they're there. And I, asked, I said to them, can you hear my voice? Yes. Am I talking to you? Yes. Well, then I'm here. I've had people telling me that we don't have bodies of flesh and bone. It's an illusion. We don't have bodies. And yet, they're wearing glasses for eyes that don't exist. They're going to have lunch to feed a body that's not there. And I've had people with tumors on their forehead telling me they don't have a tumor. Why? Because the physical world is an illusion. It's not real. I've had people telling me that death itself is an illusion. And the last time I checked, folks, the death rate is still one per person. And we all keep making it. Even the Christian science and the New Agers keep making it like everybody else. Well, where did they get this from? This comes from Hinduism, the doctrine of Maya, M-A-Y-A. -A. The doctrine of Maya is a doctrine in Hinduism that says the material universe is an illusion. And because it's an illusion, we must do everything we can to escape the wheel of reincarnation, which is mental suffering. Let's re escape this wheel so that we can achieve moksha. Now, where does this idea come from that man is divine, that man is God? It's a very old story. It started in a garden a long, long time ago. And in Genesis 3, we are told there 
the very first quote attributed to Satan, who appeared under the auspices of a serpent, the very first quote in the mouth of the arch enemy of God is a question. That's the first quote. And what's that question? Hath God really said? Did God really say that? Question mark. He questions the authority of God's word. That's how it starts. He sows doubt. And look at the response of Eve. Satan says, has God said, you shall not surely die? She says, well, the Lord said that, that we, we, can, we, can, we can eat of every tree, but of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we cannot, we should, we cannot eat it or touch it. Whoa, wait a minute here. God said nothing about touching the tree. He said, don't eat of its fruit. What's happening? He's got her. She's already confused. She's muddled the message. He's got her. And now he knows he's got her. He goes in for the frontal attack, and here it comes. You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, you shall be as Elohim. In Hebrew, it could be translated either a singular or a plural. You shall be as gods, as the King James has it, or you shall be as God, as other translations have it. It could be translated either way. What was the lie? You can become God. Why do you need God to supervise you? Why do you need God to look after you when you can become your own God and determine your own destiny? And what do we hear people say today? I don't need God. I'm God. I'm my own Lord. I'm the master of my destiny. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm God. That's the heart of the rebellious man. That's what we hear all over our world today. I don't need God. I'm God. I'm God. I determine what is right for me. And so, the idea that man can become God, the same lie that Satan fell into, the idea that he would be like the Most High, he shall rule like God over the stars of God, the very same lie is the lie of Hinduism, the lie of Buddhism, it's the lie of the New Age. Even our Mormon missionary friends, our Mormon friends have bought into that lie. Because every male Mormon missionary hopes that he will become a god. This raises a lot of pro problematic questions. So in the New Age movement, the emphasis is not on the outside. The New Age movement says, look within. You see, Christianity says, the problem is in here. It's called the deceitful heart, which is deceitful above all things. The problem is your sin. You are in rebellion against the Holy God. The answer is out here. It's God who has to reach down. It's God who has to take that stony heart and give a heart of flesh in its place. The New Age movement says the opposite. The answer is in here, and the problem is out there. Isn't that right? You want to find peace? Look within. You want to be enlightened? Look within. The answer is within you. Because at the core of your being is your true identity. And what does the New Age movement say? You are divine. The same lie we saw in Genesis 3, verse 5. When you look at the New Age movement and you compare it to Christianity, they are galaxies apart. Christianity says God is a personal being. Notice what he says in Scripture. I am the Lord your God. Subject-object relationship. I am the Lord your God. But in the New Age movement, God is impersonal. You can't talk to him. Talking to God in that worldview is, is like me talking to that light bulb. It's impersonal. It's an energy. It's a force. It has no emotion, no will. Who is Jesus Christ according to the New Age movement? Do they believe in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do they believe that Jesus Christ is the God-man, second person of the Holy Trinity? Absolutely not. Jesus Christ was a man 
who was endued with the Christ idea. What is the Christ idea? The spiritual idea that you are divine. When Jesus used that Christ idea, he discovered that he was one with the Father. He could say, I am one with the Father. Why? Because he recognized his true identity. He was divine within himself. And therefore, when we talk about atonement, we talk about this word atonement. Well, to the New Age movement, atonement doesn't mean the covering of sin. Atonement is hyphenated to mean at one meant. I am at one meant with God. What does that mean? I am God. I am one with God. Remember Shirley MacLaine? I am God. Yog, the uh, Yogi Maharaj, uh, the Yogi from uh, Transcendental Meditation, he said, even the Bible says that we are God. And he quoted Psalm 46, where it says, be still and know that you are God. Is that what the Bible says? Christians would go home and go, oh, gee, I didn't know it said that. What does it say? Be still and know that I am God. You be still. Man, be still. Know that I am God. The New Age movement also teaches that Jesus Christ was a divine guru. He was a divine teacher. Some believe, like the Hare Krishna, that Jesus Christ was an avatar of Krishna. Well, what's an avatar? I'm not talking about those blue-skinned people in the movies. Like the movie Avatar. They teach that Jesus was an avatar, an appearance of Krishna. Other Hindus say Jesus was an avatar of Vishnu, one of the Hindu gods, the preserver god. Others say that Jesus Christ was a medium. And others say that Jesus Christ was a warlock. Does anyone know what a warlock is? A warlock is a male witch. That's the Jesus of the New Age movement. He's not a savior. He's a teacher. He's not a savior, a redeemer. He is a guide to show you the way. But he is not the way. And so what do we have here, folks? What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4? Beware of those who preach another Jesus. Christianity says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Man has a disease. Man has a sickness. What is his sickness? His sin. His disobedience against a holy God. The New Age movement says there is no sin. You see, if there is no God, no personal God, then there is no judge, and then there's no accountability. And if there's no accountability, then there's no sin, because all is God. And if all is God, all is good. So the New Age movement doesn't talk about sin. And if there's anything that is considered bad, well, karma will simply take care of that. Christianity, historically, teaches the concept of eternal punishment. The New Age movement says hell is not real. The New Age movement says that hell represents illusionary consciousness. It's illusion. It's not real. Christianity says we need to be saved. We need salvation. We are people who are in rebellion against God. We need grace. We need redemption. The New Age movement doesn't use the language of salvation. It uses the language of enlightenment. You don't need to be saved in the New Age. You need to be enlightened. You need to discover who you are. Christianity says that the greatest goal of the believer is to depart and to be with Christ, to have eternal fellowship with God. What does the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, of Faith say? The whole duty of man is to do what? The whole goal of man is to do what? It's to enjoy God forever. But the New Age movement says... Man's ultimate goal is not heaven. It's not to be in relationship with God. Man's ultimate goal is self-realization and nirvana. Entering into nirvana. Those who hold to nirvana believe. Does anyone know what nirvana means? I'm not talking about a rock group by the name of Nirvana by Kurt Cobain. I'm talking about the Sanskrit word nirvana means literally, it's the idea of taking a candle, lit, and then doing this. Snuffing it out. Nirvana means to snuff out. Every Buddhist has the hope 
of doing what? He hopes that he will face self-annihilation so that he will become one with the great oneness. It's like a drop of water taking a cup of water down to the pond and putting those drops into the pond. What do you notice? The drops lose their distinctiveness. They become one with the body of water. That's what Buddhists are looking forward to, my friends. They're not looking forward to fellowship with the Buddha. They're looking to self-annihilation, to annihilate the self. Why? Because the self is the cause of suffering, and it's what brings you back in the wheel of, of samsara. The greatest refutation of the New Age movement is the Lord Jesus himself. The resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrates that the doctrine of reincarnation is false. Why? When Jesus Christ returned from the dead, if reincarnation was true, his body would have remained in the grave and his spirit would have migrated into another life form. But something very strange happened on that first Easter Sunday. As his women disciples ran to the tomb, something was missing. The body of Jesus was in there. And when he appeared to his disciples, and they thought they saw a ghost, he says, look at my hands, look at my feet. It's I myself. The spirit does not have flesh and bone as I do. And they were still in amazement. He says, do you have any bread or, or fish here? They give him some bread and broiled fish. He takes the bread and eats it in their presence. Well, why? Well, ghosts don't eat. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead demonstrates the false idea that man is reincarnated. What does Hebrews 9.27 say? It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this comes multiple reincarnations. No, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this comes judgment. Satan has conned people into thinking that they can come back again and again. What does that mean? The second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance. You can come back and back and back and back, and you can make it up in the future lifetime. God says, here's your chance. It's now. And after this, you're, not going to, you're either going to the smoking section or the non-smoking section. There is no purgatory. You're going to face me in judgment. The authority of Christianity is the scriptures, the word of God, sola scriptura, scripture alone. The New Age movement, what is their authority? Themselves. If I am God then I determine what is right and wrong. I can determine what is right for me. I can determine what is wrong for me. And so in the New Age movement, since you are God, you become the center of authority. Christianity is looking forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus. That is the blessed hope of the church. I mean, think about it. What is the church waiting for? We have work to do. We have to occupy till he comes. But what is it that we're waiting for? What is the blessed hope of the church? The appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are eagerly waiting for the coming of our Lord. The New Age movement says, we're not looking for Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus Christ came already. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, claimed to be Jesus Christ. There's a man living in South Korea right now by the name of Sun Young Moon. The leader of the Moonies, the Unification Church. Sun Young Moon says he is the Lord of the Second Advent. Father Divine, an Eastern mystic from India, said that when his plane was descending into London's airport, he fulfilled the scripture in Matthew 24 that said, Lo, behold, he shall come with the clouds. David Koresh of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, claimed to be the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jim Jones of the People's Temple, who led all those people to Guyana and committed mass suicide, claimed to be Jesus Christ. There's a man down in Puerto Rico right now who claims to be Jesucristo, Jesus Christ in Spanish. They're here. They're amongst us. But what does the New Age movement look forward to? They're not looking for the second coming. They're looking for the age of Aquarius. They're looking for a self-realized humanity. Christianity speaks about forgiveness. God offers forgiveness. 
through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But remember, if there's no sin in the New Age movement, well then what do you have? You have the law of karma. What's the law of karma? The, the law of cause and effect, which eventually will lead you into self-realization. Christianity talks about absolutes. Did you know that God has given us, within his word, within his moral law, God has given us absolutes. Do you know that there are certain things in this world that are absolutely evil? Do you know murder is an absolute evil? Everywhere, anywhere, at any time. Do you know rape is an absolute moral evil? That it is abominable anywhere, at any place, at any time? Several years ago at Ryerson University in Toronto, I was asked to come and speak on the existence of God. And uh, before I went up to speak, there was uh, an atheist there. And uh, he came up to me and he said, do I grill you now or grill you later? I said, well, you can grill me at the uh, Q&A period. I'll be well done by then. And sure enough, after I did my presentation on the existence of God, he was front line. He was in the front row, had his hand up, and said, well, you said in your lecture that absolute morals exist because God exists. I said, absolutely. If God exists, then moral absolutes exist. If he doesn't exist, then there are no moral absolutes. He says, well, I don't believe in God, and therefore I don't believe in moral absolutes. I said, in front of the whole crowd, this was a, in, a, in a room filled with students, I said, what do you think about rape? He said, excuse me? I said, well, what do you think about rape? Is it right or wrong? Or is it relative? And I'll never forget the answer he gave. He said, it depends on the culture. Now, in the room, there were a couple of sisters. I mean, sisters. <laughs> and at the beginning of the lecture, they were all gung-ho on the atheist side. Yes, yes, yes. And when two of them heard this, they looked to this guy and they said, Say what? And I realized very quickly, I didn't know at the time, but apparently this is a very dangerous sign. When the head bops... And the hand does this, and they speak to the hand. I didn't understand what this meant at the time. But I later realized this was a very threatening posture. Because what this man was basically saying was, oh, oh you know, it's, it's okay as long as the culture permits it. And I said, you know, I had to call for order. Let's calm down. This is a university after all. We're allowed to critically analyze. All of a sudden, these women became believers in absolute morals. Immediately, when we brought up the subject of rape. And so, I said to this man, I said, listen... The one thing I have to credit you is at least you're consistent as an atheist. Because the thing that I cannot stand are atheists who say there is no God, but then they pretend like there are absolute morals, there are certain things that are absolutely wrong, based on what? On your opinion? What if I disagree with you? And so I said to this young man, I said, at least you're being consistent. And I said, do you know that the Bible even mentions you? He was so proud, he says, it does? I said, yes, in fact, I said, it mentions you twice. Psalm 14, verse 1, and Psalm 53, verse 1, in case you didn't get it the first time, God repeated it. Amen. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And you know what that word fool means? If you have an NIV, look at the footnote. The word fool is the Hebrew word nabal, N-A-B-A-L. And if you look at the footnote in your NIV, the Hebrew word nabal means, listen to this, someone who is morally deficient. The one who says there is no God is someone who is morally deficient. Why is he morally deficient? Because he has no source. He has no grounding for what he says. There's no basis for what he says. My atheist friends get so mad at me because I tell them one of the reasons why I'm a Christian is because of you. They get really angry. They go, I, they, well, they say, well, how, can, how are we making you a Christian? I said, well, every time you open your mouth, you're proving the Bible's true. I said, do you fear God? Absolutely not. Romans 3, 9. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I asked them, what do you think about the idea that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that God sent his son to save the world by dying a horrible death? What type of a God would send his son to die such a bloody death? And what type of a God? I wouldn't do that to my son. Would you send your son to die? 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And I tell them, every time you open your yap, you're proving me right. And they get angry. 
But the Bible does diagnose the problem. Man makes excuses. Let me just end with just a few things here, and then we'll open up for questions and answers. Some people in the New Age have tried to argue that the Bible actually teaches certain things, like reincarnation. They will say, well, doesn't it say in the Gospel that Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah, who had come? Doesn't Jesus say that if you will receive it, then John is that Elijah who was to come? But you see, the problem is when they quote these passages of Scripture, you see, there's a principle of interpretation, folks, that you should learn. When you read a passage of Scripture, remember, Christians don't just believe in sola scriptura, Scripture alone, we also believe in tota scriptura. What is tota scriptura? All of Scripture. The totality of Scripture. Was John the Baptist, Elijah, reincarnated? Absolutely not. We got some major problems with that. Why? Well, to be reincarnated, you have to die first. Elijah never died. Elijah was translated, taken up. And in Luke chapter 1, what did the angel Gabriel say to Zechariah? That your son will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's not going to be Elijah. He will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And in John 1.21, when John the Baptist was asked by the religious leaders, are you Elijah? Guess what he said? No. No, I am not. You have to show this to your friends. Well, they said, well, of course Jesus believed that we could be reincarnated. Didn't he tell Nicodemus, you have to be born again? Well, he did say you have to be born again. He didn't say you have to be born again and 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 again until you reach nirvana. In fact, the word born again is actually not a very good translation. The literal Greek wording there is born from above. You have to be born from above. You must be born of the Holy Spirit. You must be born of God to become a child of God. What about the law of karma? John 9. Jesus is walking to the temple with his disciples and there's a blind man. And the disciples say to Jesus, Master, why is this man born blind? Is it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents? Aha, the new age. Aha, we got karma. You see, that's karma. He was reincarnated as a blind person because he did something evil. And by the way, folks, in India today, people who are born blind and lame and who are born deaf, according to Hinduism, they're born that way because of something they did in a previous life. And that's why when Mother Teresa began doing her work in Calcutta, Hindu scholars were debating whether or not what she was doing would be detrimental to India because she would be interfering with the law of karma. That's why it's not uncommon to walk through the streets of India and see people literally rotting to death on the streets. Why is it that people don't help them? Because if you help them, you're going to interfere with their karma and you're going to get it. And it's going to stall your progress into nirvana or moksha. Why is it that historically, who built the great hospitals? It was the church. Did you see the Hindus running and saying, let's build hospitals and orphanages and let's uh, build leper colonies to help people with leprosy? Who built the great hospitals, the great universities? All of them were built by the churches. What compelled them to build these charitable organizations? The Salvation Army. Or in Toronto, we have the Scott Mission. What is it about Christianity that says we must help the poor, we must dress the naked, we must feed the hungry, we must help the blind, we must help the lepers? What compels them to do that? The love of Jesus. Do you see Muslims running around building hospitals? No. And if they do, it's usually for Muslims. Even our Jewish friends, B'nai B'rith, whenever you hear them doing anything, it's usually only for the cause of the Jewish people. But the church doesn't look at whether you're Jew or you're a, a, a black person or you're Asian. It, it, it has, it's colorblind. It looks at you as the image of God. You are someone with dignity, integrity. You are a human being made in the image of the Creator and you deserve protection. You deserve liberty. You deserve the freedom of expression. The freedom of, That comes from our Judeo-Christian principles. 
And you know why we have that? Because God made humans in his image. They're not apes. They're not animals. They're not amoebas. They're not protoplasms walking around. They are people made in his image. And the death of Christ on the cross demonstrated that human beings are not junk. Human beings have value. So what happens to this blind man? Were they saying that he was reincarnated that way? Absolutely not. The Jews had believed under the rules of the rabbis that if someone committed a grievous sin in their life, it was believed that God could punish them with, with sickness. Does that sound familiar to some of the fellow evangelists we hear today? The rabbis also believed that, why did they say, well, did his mother, his parents sin that he was born this way? The rabbis taught that if a Jewish woman walked into an, an idol temple and worshipped idols, they believed that God would punish her child with deformity. The disciples were simply reacting to what was the understanding of the rabbinic tradition of the day. And Jesus' response says, no, it's not because he sinned or because his parents sinned. Why was this man born blind? For the glory of God. Have you ever wondered why some of us get sick? Did you ever wonder that sometimes illness is meant for the glory of God? Did you know that God's goal and purpose for your life is not for you to be happy? A lot of people say, I just want to be happy. Well, we're not happy anymore, so we're going to go our separate ways. We can't live together anymore. We, marriage is over. We're not happy. Do you ever hear people talk like that? The ultimate goal of the human is not to be happy. The ultimate goal of the human is to know God and to enjoy Him forever to have personal relationship with God. Does joy come into the picture? Of course. But happiness is not something you achieve. It's not a state. It's a process. It goes with the flow. It goes with the trek. So Jesus heals this blind man, and he shows us that God intended for that man to be born blind so that he would be glorified in that man. It's not what we like hearing today. What we like hearing today is, it's Satan! It's Satan! Bind him! That's what we hear today. It's Satan that's doing this. And yet Moses, in Exodus 4.22, he stands before God and, and God says, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to get my people out. And he goes, but, but Lord, you see, a lot of people don't know this, but Moses had a speech impediment. Did you know that? He was slow of speech. Now, you don't get that from Charlton Heston. He speaks great in the Ten Commandments. But Moses was slow of speech. And, 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 and here comes God saying, I'm going to use you, Moses. Yeah, but Lord, I'm not a good speaker. Choose Aaron. Aaron's an eloquent speaker. God said, fine, I'll send, I'll send both of you. And God says to Moses, who made man's mouth? Who makes man blind? Who makes the deaf? Who makes the crippled? Is it not I, the Lord? Right there, Exodus 4, 20, Exodus 4, not 22. It's before that, I think, verse 10 or 11. I, the Lord, have made them. For what purpose? Does sickness have a purpose? You better believe it, it does, because if it doesn't have a purpose, then life is meaningless. There's no meaning to life. Everything is just in a state of chaos and flux. There's no purpose to anything. God has a purpose even in our illnesses. What's the future goal of the New Age movement? The future goal of the New Age movement is that we will have a one world government run by an enlightened leader. That's what some of them teach. The goal is to have a one world religion. But there's only one particular faith who stands in the way. It's this faith that, that talks about exclusive, one way, only one way to God. It's that faith called Christianity. One New Ager said to me, all religions are true. And I said, so that means my religion is true. She said, yes. I said, so you better repent and accept Jesus Christ or you're going to hell. She says, oh, all religions are true but yours. Uh, 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 you can't eat your cake and have it and have it too. Come on now. We've got to be consistent. 
But there's only one thing in the way, and that's the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis put it this way. In the last battle of religion, he said the last battle of religion will be between Christianity and Hinduism. It'll be between inclusivism and exclusivism. It will be between the one way versus the many ways. And that's why, folks, people hate Christianity. You know why they hate it? Because it says, you come on God's terms. There's only one way to God. The world says, there's many ways to God. It doesn't matter. All religions lead to God. God is up in heaven. He's, he's walking around. It's like musical chairs. And someone goes, Allah, and he sits down. And then he gets up, walk, Krishna, he sits down. He responds to any name. But that's not the God of the Bible. And I want to end with this. If you can just turn to Acts chapter 13, and we will end the evening and open up for Q&A. Acts chapter 13. What is God's response to the New Age movement? Acts 13, and we're going to look at verses 6 to 12. Acts 13, verses 6 to 12. They, that is Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer. Remember the word sorcerer, Deuteronomy 18? There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. So here's this governor, this proconsul. He's interested in hearing the word of God. He wants to hear God's word. He's excited about the gospel. Notice immediately what happens. Remember, one word Luther taught. This is what Luther said. Luther said, wherever God plants his church, Satan always plants his chapel. He's never far behind. Notice what happens. The moment he wants to hear the word of God, verse 8, but Ilimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the pro council from the faith. You see the opposition? Then Saul who was also called Paul. Now, please notice this. This is not Paul's words now. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. So what he's going to say is going to be divine utterance. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked straight at Elimus and he said, please notice how God defines the new age now. You are a child of the devil. An enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? What does the New Age movement do? The New Age movement is a child of the devil. It is an enemy of what is right. It's full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. It perverts the right ways of the Lord. Notice the judgment of God, verse 11. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Look at verse 12. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Do you see how God not only brings judgment but God glorifies himself in bringing this man to faith. Folks, the New Age movement is a dangerous, dangerous movement. It is like a fire. The moth is attracted to the flame. And some Christians have played with it. They've tampered with it. Unlike the other moths, they don't go straight into the fire and die. Their wings get singed and they fall to the ground. The New Age movement is dangerous. The worst kind of thing that could happen in the New Age movement is demonic possession. I don't have time to go into details tonight, but my wife and I have been involved in cases of exorcism where people have opened doors, they have made an opening, whether it's through yoga, whether it's through channeling, they have opened a door and allowed 
these entities to enter. And my friends, let me tell you something. Exorcism is not a pretty sight. And I'm not talking about mental illness. I'm not talking about schizophrenia. I'm not talking about bipolar disorder. We have sent people to psychiatrists and they were diagnosed with mental illness. But when certain things happen that psychiatry cannot explain, such as levitation and other languages, intimate knowledge of things that, that you would never have supposed this person to know, then you know you're dealing with something beyond the physical. And I've seen it with my own eyes. I have seen what demon possession can do to people. It utterly destroys them. And I have seen Jesus Christ set those people free. And he came not just to heal the brokenhearted. He says, I have come to set the captives free. And when Jesus Christ comes, he is the only one that can do it. The New Age movement is like a doorknob on a door. It's enticing. It invites you. The moment you walk in that door and you close it, you realize there's no doorknob on the other side. You're trapped. My wife can tell you story after story. She was involved in the New Age movement for 12 years. And there was one incident where in her nephew's house, her nephew began to experience extra phenomenal activity in the house. The bed would start rattling. It would rise at times. Now, some of us think that's just the imagination of a child, but he was fully awake when this was happening. And so what does my wife do? Well, she goes to the New Age bookstore in uh, Toronto, the Omega Center, and they tell her that it's a, a native spirit and you need to get these incense sticks and, and you can get rid of them with these incense sticks. What she didn't realize at the time is you can't put fire out with fire because you cannot use the devil's trickery to cast out the devil. It's his own trickery. And so she went to the home and she lit this incense stick and she was commanding this thing, whatever it was, to leave. She was struck on the arm and she was thrown across the room. The place in which she was struck, now if I heard that story I would say that's just your imagination. But wait a minute, she developed shingles on her arm. And she was in her early 30s I believe at that time. Shingles is not something that happens to young people. It's usually associated with older age. When she saw her doctor, her doctor couldn't believe she had shingles. It was in the exact location she was struck. They're real folks. When Jesus came and you read it in the Gospels, you'll notice a lot of the Gospels tell us about his healings and his exorcisms. Why are they there? To show you that he was invading and destroying the kingdom of the evil one. And notice what he said to them. He told them to get out. They knew who he was, and he told them to get out. He wasn't telling schizophrenia to get out. He was addressing these entities. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle against the dark rulers of this age. But praise be to God that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I give you power, Jesus said, to tread upon scorpions and serpents. They are subject to you in my name. And the enemy, the power of the enemy, he says, will not be able to hurt you. Praise be to God for that. Amen. We'll open up for a Q&A. If you would like to... Yes. Yes, the New Age movement has uh, the, the, the scariest, one of the scariest things I have seen in the past decade or so is the infiltration of the New Age movement into the church. And you see it particularly in the word faith movement. The idea that you can name it and claim it, or as I put it, blab it and grab it. Um, the fact that you can visualize Paul Yonggi Cho of South Korea, the largest South Korean church. Paul Yonggi Cho taught in his book, The Fifth Dimension, that believers could visualize reality by faith and speaking it into reality with the spoken word. 
In fact, he tells us in his book that a South Korean woman came to him and said that she wanted to meet a Christian husband, etc. And he says, what you have to do is visualize the kind of husband that you want and speak him into faith. Well, this is not Christianity, folks. This is New Age thinking. This is the idea that since you are a God within, you can visualize reality. The word faith teachers also say that you should never be sick. You should never be poor. That as God's child, you should always be well. You should never be sick, never have cancer, never have any disease. You should always be well. That's not Christianity. What did Paul say? I have learned to be content in every situation I am. He says that the Lord gave him a thorn in the flesh. And three times he asked the Lord to remove it. And what did the Lord say? Every time Paul said, please, Lord, take away this thorn in the flesh, what was the response of the Lord? No, my grace is sufficient for you. See, a lot of Christians don't realize this, but did you know that no is an answer? Did you know no is an answer? I mean, we pray, we always want God to say yes. Lord, give me this. Yes. Lord, give me this. Yes. But they don't realize that they say, I have people say, you know, the Lord never answers me. I've been asking him for this, and he never asked have you ever thought that maybe he did answer you and the answer was no? No is an answer. You also see this in the teachings of uh, Benny Hinn, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Paul Crouch, Kenneth uh, Hagen. They taught that we are all little gods, that we are little gods, that we are Christs, little Christs on the earth. And so this ideology, the emergent church also teaches that uh, we don't know what the gospel is. We, we have no uh, certainty about what the gospel is. So the emergent church has opened up the doors of skepticism again. The, the idea that everything is relative. Uh, and so this new age ideology is very prevalent, particularly among the emergent church, uh, the word faith movement. Um, and, and, and basically it says, you can do it. You can claim that healing. You could speak funds into that bank account. In the name of Jesus, command funds to enter into that bank account. That's not Christianity, folks. That's snake oil. That's snake oil being peddled. And the worst part about it is they're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ, which is blasphemy. Utter blasphemy. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir.